Don Wells is in the news again. He's written an open letter to the people he believes kidnapped his daughter, Summer. There are a lot of questions still up in the air, as well as accusations. So let's take another look at some of the behavior breakdowns we did on Don. In the comments, let us know what you think. Okay, you ready? Here we go. I can't imagine how you've been feeling these past couple days. Yeah, it's been rough. But we know, you know, we believe in the resurrection. I've never seen so many Christians in one place in my life. Like I said, and it's, that's pretty awesome to see that. And I just hope God in His, in his mercies will deliver someone home to us. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so interesting in terms of the, uh, I guess, uh, content of what he talks about, you know, can't, I, I can't imagine how you're feeling. And he defers to society, religion, and God. So interesting deferral. I'm not sure really what it says, but it, it isn't necessarily talking about his specific feelings, though it could be an element of, I guess, feeling supported by, um, by society, by the religion, by the God involved. Anyway, with sound off, uh, on the whole, very comforting gestures around around the sun. So uh, that felt good to me. Downward inflections in the voice when you've got the sound on, that sounds assured. So comfort, assurance, uh, his weight is forward as well so that seems like he's kind of leaning into the story he wants to deliver information to him to, to us tongue grooming uh, beforehand i'll just say now that i see that throughout i think that's a, a consistent kind of preparation before he speaks though though i'm open to other views on on that for me it seemed like a a baseline preparation that he always does boy's head is hung um is that is that shame is that grief is it just the sunlight they're facing into the sun at the moment not sure at this point but anyway that's that's what i've got as a as a first off on this uh, first piece here uh, chase what do you got for us yeah agree with you mark and this is a clip where we're not seeing much emotion. We're not seeing a lot of anger, sadness, stress, or anything else. And just you watching this as a, a, an interesting data point for you as a panelist is that the reporter didn't ask a question. The, port, the reporter used what's called a provocative statement. And this is part of a, a licitation that people in the intelligence community get trained on. As far as I know, this is the first thing you learn when you learn about getting information out of people. And I think the reason that this unrehearsed statement about resurrection really came up is because no question was asked. And in the intelligence community, we, <laughs> they have a saying that says, the more sensitive the information you need, the less questions you should be asking. So the more we wanna to default to elicitation. And I think that's why this came out. I think it's also interesting that he defaults to saying we believe in the resurrection, which suggests or denotes that he has either made the decision that she's not coming back or she's dead or that he's just uh, already aware of it. And I think it's interesting with his son there beside him that I think they're providing each other equal amounts of comfort. I think the son is also become a pacifier for him. And it, it, you see in his high stress moments, he increases the physical contact and movement on the sun, kind of reassuring him, pulling him in a little bit closer. Not a whole lot of certainty here about what this means yet. So this is just the first video. We'll get to the next one, Scott. All right. Uh, usually when somebody goes straight to religion right out of the gate, that's a red flag for me. I believe in the resurrection never seen so many Christians in one place in my life. But in this case, I think it's it's a little bit different. I think it, in, in this situation, this guy probably hasn't done a lot of public speaking. He probably doesn't know what to say. So I think maybe out of nervousness, he goes right to that. Now, his background is a little bit sketchy as far as uh, getting in trouble for things. So he's been, he's gotten a little bit of trouble before. So that may be something to help shine him up, make him look good. Make, help spiff him up a little bit for people watching. Oh, he's a good guy, just in case. And, and I agree, Chase, he's used that little boy as an adapter. 
you know, holding on to it. But I think they both are because it, it's a it's a trying time. I'm not seeing a whole lot of grief here. I'm not seeing tons of it anyway. You can tell the guy's not in the, he's 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 down. But those are, are more sleepy movements. He looks tired, really, more than anything t- to me in, the, in this case. His blink rate is through the roof. So that's it, it could be a tick. Sometimes it's high and sometimes it's not. So it could be that he's nervous. Could could be when the first uh, when the first interview starts. It might be one of his first ones. I don't know. So he may be a little bit nervous about that. And when we when we look at these nonverbals as well, culture is going to play a, a huge part in this. The way they act, the way they stand, the way they deliver the information that they're they're going to give us. So keep that in mind as we go through, and I'll point out some other things to let you know that his voice is fairly monotone as well. But we know, you know, we believe in the resurrection. Never seen so many Christians in one place in my life. Like I say. And let's start paying attention to how many times he says "and" and "so," because we see that pop up at some key points over and over and over and over and over. In some of this, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so if I start off, I'm going to say that your experience colors who you are and how you respond. I would say the organism does what the organism does. If you've been in trouble with the law, if you've got drama in your house, if you've been arrested a few months ago for domestic things, you're going to feel uncomfortable in front of a camera and under scrutiny. Doesn't mean that you did something to your child. It simply means that you got baggage associated with that, number one. Number two, he comes out of the gate immediately with religion, but he doesn't say, as God is my witness. He says, we believe in the resurrection. We believe in the resurrection. That automatically makes you think that he assumes the girl's dead, but there could be another reason. And guys, I'm not making an excuse. I'm just going to tell you why that could happen. If you've converted to a religion, Maslow's hierarchy among people who have the same religion is saying the same things. And he probably rarely speaks outside of church. I saw the other day, he's in, he's in Seventh-day Adventist, and he was up talking in front of church. So it's probably a standard line he does every time he stands in front of people. And maybe a catchphrase, not literally a catchphrase only, but a way that makes him more comfortable. At the same time, he's gripping that little kid's shoulder, and the kid is getting comfort too. But at one point, he's gripping the kid's shoulder, and the kid looks up at him like, hey, that's a little tight. So it's, it's just, it's an adapter, as you guys have already said. In terms of sadness, you know, I always talk about this muscle and refer to this as a grief muscle, but it really isn't a single muscle. What's happening there with people is all these muscles, and I won't ever remember the name of them except for the big ones, but as these muscles, as you feel sad or sorrow, that internal part of the brow rises, the other brow comes down. And then as that's happening, most of us, when we're sad, our our brow rises. And this is fighting that is how you get a little arch there. It's a bunch of muscles involved that causes that look. What you need to be paying attention to when someone, I just read a study yesterday from 2012, and I'll, we'll put it down in the, in, below. But they said that the frontalis muscle blowing out the grief, all those grief lines is the best indicator of deception that most people can notice. So when the person's doing what I call request for approval, instead of that, it shows something. So here you see a little bit of an arch, but not much. But you do see that sadness. You see his, his eyebrows lifted up. And the indicators of grief or sadness are that arch, the brows lifted, and the corners of the mouth down. He has facial hair, but look at the corners of his mouth. They're drawn. He has some tears in his eyes or sweat. Hard to tell. It is hot. It is Tennessee this time of the year. He doesn't stance. He doesn't take high ground. He simply uses that religion piece. And he is adapting. We typically would say those are red flags and the, and the flash, the blink flash, the blink rate goes through the roof. So I'd pay attention. Those things make me wonder if he knows something, but we'll go through this as we go. Remembering that it's, I'll show you one really good indicator that's hard to fake. It's really hard to fake your, this up and your brow and your lids down unless you're sad. Your lids down and your brow up that way usually indicates somebody's sad. Um, this going to immediately to worst case makes us all feel like he's knows the girl's dead. But if you have been in prison a few times, if you've been in trouble and things typically go badly for you, you might assume that they're all going to go bad for you. So try to try to read what a person's been through and that gives you the next piece. And that's what I got. Excellent. I can't imagine how you've been feeling the past couple of days. Yeah, it's been rough. But we know, you know, we believe in the resurrection. Never seen so many Christians in one place in my life, like I say. You know, that's pretty awesome to see that. And I just hope God in his, in his mercies will deliver someone home to us. Let's move on. 
not knowing what happened, do you have any kind of a gut feeling about it? Do you have any kind of an instinct feeling about it? I wish I did. Some bad person grabbed her, but we have no idea that the FBI and the police have covered every single base, everything that anybody can think of they've covered. Okay, I'll go first on this one. This is the first one where I said, wait a minute, something's not right here. Bunch of red flags up in this one. It's fairly short. There's a lot going on. I won't suck up everything. Don't worry, you guys. Uh, the first thing right out of the gate on this one, do you have a gut feeling about what you think about what might happen? No, I sure don't. Somebody bad must have taken her. You know, he said, I wish I did. Somebody bad grabbed her. I wish I did. Some bad person grabbed her, but we have no idea that his cadence is slow. Doesn't show a whole lot of stress in his voice, but man, he's moving around a lot. He's squishing back and forth, moving around that arm, gets that thing to go in. This is the first time he's really he's really been lit up. Greg, what do you got? So I see internal conversation and distraction about what don't know. In the very beginning, you know, he's, he's got something going on where he's almost not engaged. Is it the last question? Not really sure. But he's got some internal thing going on. I do see that same, you know, lilted eyebrows up in the front. And when he's talking, I don't see this request for approval like, hey, believe me, don't you? So do I see red flags? Absolutely. When I see his blink rates go up and his respiration increase and that kind of thing, I see red flags and it makes me want to poke on him. First time I saw this video, my first thing was he knows something. Now, the, again, there's lots of reasons. We say this about people all the time. There's lots of reasons why you can feel a way and increase. This only gives us the next question. And to your point, Chase, if I were the reporter standing there, I might go and poke and say, what makes you think it's somebody or go down that path? We can't do that. We're not controlling it. We're seeing what we see here. And I would then want to ask another question is what I'm seeing. Chase, what do you got? I would do much of the same. And I would probably throw in a lot of elicitation there. Uh, just to just to make sure that fans out that answer just turns into a fan and elicitation is great for that I, mean, I think it's uh you, you covered the stress and you covered him becoming more illustrated and i think it's interesting that he's becoming more illustrated telling people or wanting people to think that everything's already been done and i would say this is a red flag because on, on a continuum of like, I want everyone to help me or I want people to think that this case is unsolvable. He's all the way on the, on the other side where he's communicating that everything's already been done and there's no request. There's no saying we're running down leads where he's saying we've done everything already. It's all been done. I think that's, it's unusual uh, communication from somebody missing their child but I don't think is necessarily deceptive. Mark? Yeah. Uh, so again, three for three, we get the, the tongue action before he starts to speak. Uh, I, I see what you're saying there, Chase. Let's not discount it uh, ever, but three for three, he always seems to start with that, but let's not discount it. You're right. Um, this is not, and, and come back at me on this, Chase, this is not a case of a missing perpetrator anymore because a perpetrator has been, has been, you know, it's some, it's some bad person and, and, and has grabbed her. So there is a, a, a good, strong theory about the type of person and some of the action involved. So this is better off than what we often get, which is just perpetrator, you know, the, no idea, not even mentioned, and there's no idea. However, everybody's right here that, that it, it is running, it, it, it's suggested that they're running out of leads, running out of places to go. And, and the story is now has a sense of hopelessness to it. As the story builds, it runs out of places to go. And I believe we see his emotion build around that. And we, and we do start to hear some difference in the voice, uh, some, some action in the eyes there, uh, around, around distress, sadness. Now, I think there are all kinds of reasons why there might be some, some, incongruence in the stories or just juxtapositions uh, around that. Um, but certainly this is 
possibly one of the most interesting elements of the story that we've seen so far because because there there is some difference between him going i have no i have no idea here's here's what we're looking for here's what i all here's what who i actually think it is anyway i'll leave it at that and just for one second think and guys again we're going to say this a hundred times body language is not magical we're not mind readers lots of reasons you might ramp up your heart rate in that when you're thinking about a child and somebody says who do you think took her or what do you think happened and you say we think somebody took her maybe it is what they think and that might cause your respiration to go up too so what we want you to do is to notice that every time we're looking for what should happen next and how this should tie together what does the communication look like and how does this story come out i think that's the big piece here not knowing what happened to you, any kind of a gut feeling about it? Do you have any kind of instinct feeling about it? I wish I did. It's some bad person grabbed her, but we have no idea that the FBI and the police have covered every single base, everything that anybody can think of they've covered. Okay. We good? Yeah. And he starts, you know, uh, coming up with excuses why he can't make it to work and stuff, and uh, and, and giving me trouble. And then the day I fired him, he was, uh, you know, doing a pan like that there, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, he spent probably two hours on it. Well, it just sort of took 20 minutes to coat that with mud, first coat. And we were supposed to do something else, and he just jumped on that, and he was speaking under his breath and just carrying on and then he comes to me with a pan of mud and he says there's all kind of trash in there get it out of there and give me some different mud so I was like my world okay I threw it away and got him some fresh mud and he come back at me again he's like screaming at me you know I told you that did you put it back in there or what and you're like, familiar with that kind of behavior for somebody yeah, like that yeah. it seemed like that was kind well of I looked on YouTube of, of all the, the behavior that uh, somebody on meth would have you know, mm -hmm. only thing I can rem only one I can remember is hyperactive. Sure. But uh, yeah, but, yeah uh, but he was screaming at me. You know, just go home. I'll take care of this job. I got this job. I'll handle it by myself or whatever. And I thought about that, and I went to lunch. And when I come back, and I don't believe. Mm -hmm. Get off the job. Don't want to work with you one more second. And he didn't like that too well. All right, uh, Chase. What do you got? So right here, he, he goes to about noon or one o'clock if we're looking at him with his eyes while he's talking about watching this YouTube video. This is a very vital data point for any interrogator. Not that I'm relying on some chart from 1970 of where the eyes move and what it means. I'm relying on what I just observed. Uh, he was recalling looking at something and that's where his eyes go. I'm gonna make a note of that. And then if I'm asking him to describe something visual or something where he has to recall visual data in the future, and I see somewhere different, and I see him, and it could be a guilt question that he looks a different direction, that is a huge red flag for me. Uh, there's equal eye contact to both Greg and Scott during his entire answers. There's a wonderful uh, establishment of some, some form of baseline here. And he demonstrates a lot of comfort with his body illustration. He's showing stuff with his body. He's showing this thing, uh, this drywall pan and pointing it up in the, in the room that you guys were in. He's showing the bucket with the mud in it and talking about when he threw it away. And he shakes his head while he's speaking about things that he's disagreeing about. So he's saying this guy was speaking under his breath and carrying on. And he's shaking his head during that. And then he's nodding while speaking about something that uh, he took a stand against this guy, which is a wonderful piece of baseline. He's nodding during positive things. And when he wants you to agree, he's shaking his head during things where he's disagreeing or in some kind of disagreement with what he's speaking about. I'll leave it at that. Greg? Yeah, it, this guy's telling a story and he's illustrating. This is, I'm going to guess if you're his friend and you're hanging out with him. Well, we know that if we've talked to him twice and we know that this guy has a storytelling kind of a personality, he's using references, that pan right there. He's giving you a reference. He's telling a story using his hands. He's illustrating these things that punctuate your words or thoughts. He's moving his hands to make points. He's making things bigger or smaller. He's using a lot of words that we don't hear him use in other cases. He does some downright eye accessing when he's talking about the guy 
Chase is talking about up left as he's speaking about something he visually remembers. And then he does some down right, which we typically associate with emotion. So as he's thinking as he's telling the story and he's giving out information. The cadence of his speech is a little more lilting as he's telling the story and telling you something and giving you a frame of reference for one of these guys. I told Scott it's a little bit like ghost stories when he's telling you all these different people he thinks may have done something because he's trying to give you his thoughts and illustrate it with enough words to make it fit. Now, when we start asking ask him questions about the story, Candace's story, if he doesn't have that same level of detail, it's going to automatically make people jump to red flags. If it's secondhand story, it'll be a different way of telling. But this is him telling something that happened to him. And I believe it happened to him. It's easy to follow his baseline. Scott, what do you got? As he was fairly comfortable talking about this, his illustrators were open. He was very fluid with his. He was loping as he as he talked, and loping is when you just kind of go right along and everything sounds just fine, sounds the way it should. No, uh, no deception in here anywhere. No need to be any for any deception in here. Everything looked the way it should look. Everything sounded the way it should sound, and we weren't getting any 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 pushback from him on this kind of thing. Ob obviously, for this we wouldn't. But he was, as he went into details of stuff, again, great for baseline as he starts telling about things he's experienced and is giving us that information. Because I don't think he's told anybody for the first time the things he found on the internet about uh, uh, drug use. You know, I, I don't think it's, it, it would, that would be new to him. So that was the only the only part where I'm, I, I know I did, and I'm pretty sure Greg did too, or like, you're telling us about that. And where he may have in his past have experienced those things. I don't know how to word it differently. I can be completely wrong, don't know. But that's the only one I made sure to pay attention to, attention to, so I could know if that came up again. A situation uh, I would recognize those those cues as we went through. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so absolutely right. Couldn't agree more. He's creating a, a story here. You've got all the elements of the story. He does it really well. He describes it spatially. He takes on the characters. He does the voices. He does the emotions. So a great baseline as to what he'll do if he's really engaged with a story and he wants to engage you. I think he does the YouTube piece about the meth head because he wants to cast that character as the meth head. And so he goes, look, you know, authority of YouTube, data point of one, that'll be our meth head in the story so so i think that's what he what he's kind of you know doing there i think what this says uh to me is is so he says um he, there's an upward inflection right at the start here uh i think he wants us to approve of how he handles this situation and then he describes the situation and this is really don's in my mind soap opera world because he quickly gets into this drama that is probably interesting if you're part of it and if you're outside of that you might well go what's this got to do with with anything that's going on here but it is easy to get dragged in, isn't it? It's easy to get dragged in and go, okay, there's a meth head involved, is there? Bit of violence going on. And he's pretty good at doing, you know, that, that, that it was getting quite aggressive because uh, he rubs his nose there. I think that's because he's actually getting heated himself. You'll often see people do that when they're getting aggressive because blood will rush to the nose. Uh, so I think he's, he easily draws us probably unconsciously into this soap opera world that he's got of, of drama going on. And to an extent, we need to resist that a little bit because again, we might end up getting dragged down exactly the wrong narrative here. And we've got to keep open to where the real facts might be or the real information might be as to, well, what, what's happening with summer? Uh, there, that's all I got for you. Okay. And he starts, you know, uh, coming up with excuses why he can't make it to work and stuff and, uh, and, and giving me trouble. And then the day I fired him, he was, uh, you know, doing a pan like that there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, he spent probably two hours on it. Well, it should have took 20 minutes to coat that with mud, first coat. And we were supposed to do something else, and he just jumped on that and he was speaking under his breath and just carrying on and then he comes to me with a pan of mud and he says there's all kind of trash in there get it out of there and give me some different mud so i was like oh, really? okay i threw it away and got him some fresh mud and he come back at me again and he's like screaming at me and, you know i told you that, did you put it back in there or what and you're I, familiar with that kind of behavior for somebody yeah, know, like that know. it seemed like that was kind well of i looked on youtube of, of all the the behavior that uh, somebody on meth would have 
Mm -hmm. you know, the only thing I can rem only one I can remember is hyperactive. Sure. But uh, yeah, but, yeah uh, but he was screaming at me, you know, just go home. I'll take care of this job. I got this job. I'll handle it by myself or whatever. And I thought about that, and I went to lunch. And I come back, and I told him to leave. Get off the job. Don't want to work with you one more second. And he didn't like that too well. You, you've got some past. You said recently you've had some drug and alcohol things, maybe. Have you... Who's it, who in your life would you think is less than than above board that you deal with? Who in life has been above board? Yeah, who, who's less than above board? If I was saying, oh, I no, not, not nobody that I know of except for our neighbors and stuff. You know, I mean, the guy, the the, the meth heads and stuff like that and whatever like that. I mean, we're trying to fly right and we're trying to do the no, I get right it. Right. Man, life is. Yeah, no. I would say life is a challenge between um, being this and what you, what is underneath. Okay, and let me, let me back up for a minute with the stepsisters. They said they never knew we had a daughter. Two and a half, three years ago, I called my dad and they were there. And they were bragging, you know, I was like, they was asking about Summer, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, so they said they named one of theirs Winter. Hmm. So they knew, they lied when they said they didn't know. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so in this case, we're asking him just some simple questions. Now I just lost my thought. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> hit that again. I lost it entirely. Yeah. I had something else in my mind. Let me, let me edit that it's out. Too, Greg, what yeah, do you which, got? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I may have to watch it again. Uh, which one was two? Oh, yeah. Who's above board? Here we go. There's some mm -hmm. comedy for you. So who's less than above board? You see him. He's like, what are you talking? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. And he, he does recognition. And he says, and his eyes lock as he's saying this, we try to stay above board. Now I know, and he said, I've, you know, I've used drugs, I've done this, I've done that. So he knows some people that are less than above board by my standards, and he's probably interpreting what I'm saying. And so you see him making eye contact. And then he goes back to get out one of the stories that he came there to tell, because clearly Don had stories he wanted to tell. These are the ghost stories I was talking about. He's gonna tell you these stories. So he brings up the stepsisters. And you can see it, you can see a change in his code, in, in his cadence. He starts off when he's trying to figure out what I'm talking about, stammering and stuttering and a little slow, then makes good eye contact. Oh yeah, we try to stay above board and then goes back into a storytelling mode. That's what I saw. And I just kind of discounted the sisters thing as just something he needed to get out and that was that. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I would agree completely. You, again, you've got to be careful you don't get stuck in his soap opera because this really is a piece of storytelling here. Uh, you, it's a classic. So you've got stepsisters. So that instantly tells you that they're going to be cast in, in the bad light. Uh, you're going to have a Cinderella character, the symbol of virtue unrecognized, which is the, you know, the dirty little waif and that summer. And you're going to have territorial aggression. So you've got, you know, fighting over, over the, the crown, which is, you know, the summer summer and winter battle that he that he talks about there. So there's some classics in there of a really good soap opera narrative of 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 family breakdowns and uh, territorial aggression. And so it could, you know, it, it looks a little bit like a sidestep into that narrative. But I think you're right, Greg, this is a story that he wants to to get out. Uh, he, he wants to play that narrative game, that YouTube game, as much as anybody else that he sees himself as battling against, that if they're going to make up a story, then I reckon I can tell a good story as well. And I would say it's a classic example because he draws down on a universal narrative instantly. If it were a, a truer story, there'd be more detail and it wouldn't fit so well that universal narrative so he just kind of draws down on the classic uh and just one last thing is he does a, that head that same kind of head turn away and locks eye contact with a challenge gesture there to greg on this same as he did with i think how do you get to your house so uh you know when he gets confused or maybe more likely is worried about the nature of the question and what is this question really about we see the aggression uh come out uh, here. Uh, and, and he wants to sidestep this idea of, of um, who he's connected with that don't fly right. 
Uh, so, so, you know, an interesting theme that, that carries on there. He wants to completely uh, take himself away from the names of the people that um, the call by who don't fly right there. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. This is a really interesting one because as we're going through it, he's, he's from the beginning of this, when we started talking to him, he suspects everybody. That's why he's bringing up all these parts by his stepsisters and people from YouTube and this and that. He suspects everybody. I mean, Greg, I don't know how many people, I, I think I counted up to 12 at one point he was talking about and, and talked to him the other day and he was, he was sus suspected. The guys who came and were, you know, didn't suspect trees. him, but he said, hey, what about these guys that were cutting down the trees in my yard? Could that be the kind of, I'm wondering if that would be. So he's got all these things that say he's concerned and really wondering who did this. That's one thing that, that stood out to, to us as, as we went through this. And so that's the reason he's he's poking on those those stepsisters who said some bad stuff about him whether it's true or not I have no earthly idea um but apparently it's been recanted what they said so probably not true don't know um, don't know that to be a fact yeah. but yeah oh okay yeah that's that's what he that's what he told me anyway so um yeah so as, as he's going through this it's really for me it's really simple he's he doesn't know exactly where we're going in this yet i mean he's got a pretty good idea but when we start asking questions like this that he's not ready for why would you ever ask something like that and we, but he starts associating himself he's using um what what what's called yeah you know, it's the same language addicts you addicts use you know you hear peter hyatt talking about that how people who are addicts will talk that way as well about we try to stay away from you know it wasn't i try to do this it's like we as a group, try to stay away from those kind of people. Um, that's where I'll stop there to keep short. Chase, what do you got? Uh, one thing, we're just talking about the we thing here. Don is, uh, if we divide people into using three types of pronouns in their communication, we have people that use self pronouns, team pronouns, and then others in reference to other people. And Don uses a whole lot of team pronouns, even talking about the church, our Sunday school, we like to do this. We like to do this. So always speaking about he and Candace as our, us, we, which I think is a pretty good sign for how he feels about his connection to her uh, at the time that he was answering those questions. And right at the beginning of this clip here, you're going to see him close his eyes almost all the way for a minute to process this question and process the data. So he's really going through his mind. He is honest, I think, about trying to fly right. I think he's 100% honest. But what we don't know is his definition and his relationship to the words fly right, his relationship to the idea of what that means to him. There's this head nodding that we're seeing here is honest. There's comfortable cadence that he's loping here. He's on message. So this may, whether or not this is rehearsed does not make it deception. We can rehearse true things all day long. It's like our YouTube intros. They're truthful and very, very rehearsed. So and he's shaking his head exactly at the point that he's discussing the denial of someone else. So I think this is on message, is truthful, and in an interrogation scenario, and maybe in a regular conversation, this may come in handy. But if someone tries to do this big redirection, I'm going to treat this like when he's backing up to talk about his sisters, I will treat that as a denial, and I will stop it using the same process. I'll put my hand up and say, Don, I know that's very important to you, and I promise we're going to get to that in just a minute. We go right back to what we were talking about. The reason I think, I can't speak for him, Scott and Greg did this, is because this is not an interrogation. He's not captive, and he can walk out of that room at any time, and they're not there to uh, get a confession to a crime per se. They're there to collect data, and they're specifically there to collect a whole lot of data as much as possible that can be analyzed at a later date like we're doing right now. Yeah, I, I would have been impressed if we got a confession out of a guy in a Holiday Inn conference room. Yeah, yeah, we knew that, that going was? in, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all it was, guys. We knew yeah. there was little chance anybody was going to... Well, and, and we didn't know Don from Adam. I mean, we'd seen him on TV and that. Yeah. And, yeah. But it doesn't matter. The, the fact that most people are not going to confess, I think Dr. Phil said people don't confess in a crowd, the same mindset, right? That's the way you got to look at it. You, you've got some past. You said recently you've had some drug and alcohol things. Maybe have you? Who who in your life would you think is less than than above board that you deal with? Who in life has been above board? Yeah, who, who's less than above board? If, if I were saying, oh, 
I have no, not, not nobody that I know of except for our neighbors and stuff. You know, I mean, the guy, the, the, the meth heads and stuff like that and whatever like that. I mean, we're trying to fly right and we're trying to do the no, I get right it, right. man. It, life is, yeah, no, sure. I would say life is a challenge between um, being this and what, you, what is underneath. Okay, and let me, let me back up for a minute with the stepsisters. They said they never knew we had a daughter. Two and a half, three years ago, I called my dad and they were there. And they were bragging, you know, I was like, they was asking about summer, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, so they said they named one of theirs Winter. Mm. So they knew, they lied when they said they didn't know. Yeah. Are they asking anything of you other than just people that you might suspect or, you know, situations you might suspect? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I'm at work all the time. You know, and, you know Candace was on one side of the house when she got gone. That, you know, not even, you know, 50, 60 feet away. You know, we know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. All right, Greg, what do you got? So he starts off with what we typically call a resume statement. He's going to say, look, I'm always working. I'm always away. And But his hands, if you notice, when he does talk about always being away, he drops his hand and slaps his leg. It's kind of a helpless movement. He's saying we did our best. He has... She said, look, she was only 60 feet away, shaking his head. He's looking like I have nothing left to give you and his elbows away from his body. Those are all good signs. A resume statement we might think of as a red flag to say he's doing this. And for a little levity, if you'll notice, Kevin Williams shows up at 10 seconds and leaves at 13. <laughs> Mark, what do you got? Yeah, nice. Well done. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm the same. There's, a, there's, there's kind of almost an alibi put in there, you know, I, I got nothing more to give you because I'm at work all the time. I don't think it is him trying to lay down an alibi. I think it really is him going, I wish I had more for you. I, I think what we're seeing here is disbelief, confusion at the situation. I think you're right, Greg, that's what that hand slap on the thigh is about. It's, it's that finality of that's all the information that I have. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't there. I wish I had more information. Information. You know, Candice was 50, 60 feet away. That's all the information that she has. His, his direction illustrators are congruent around that. Again, the geography works around that. Um, uh, again, four for four, lips, lips licking before he begins speaking again. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of congruence, a lot of um, fact in his mind around what he's saying. Chase, what do you got? Absolutely agree. And, and definitely agree with the lip licking. So we're starting to see this is a normal thing. So it's, 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 it's losing power as we start moving, uh, moving forward. And I think when he says, unfortunately, I'm at work all the time, what makes this really truthful and different than when other people have alibis is that he doesn't focus his statement on the day it happened yeah, i mean unfortunately i'm at work all the time he doesn't say that day i went to work at 3 15 i didn't come home till 6 50 p.m that evening so i'm at work all the time makes it more likely to be a truthful statement that's something we're more likely to see when we're looking at truthful videos yeah, i mean unfortunately i'm at work all the time and i think it was extremely unusual when he said when she got gone. You know, Candace was on one side of the house when she got gone. I think that may be a cultural thing, maybe something out there. But I also think that uh, he doesn't like his job very much. We see what's called, from a just a behavior perspective, it's not relevant uh, to the case, but we see his elbow move out when he says, I'm at work all the time. We see that little, that's indicative of disagreement. A lot of times, that's one of the first things I teach HR managers to look for in job interviews <laughs> when they're interviewing people for a job. And when he says there is no way she would leave the property, I think the kid disagrees with that. Well, we know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. I think his son disagrees, and I think we can see him break eye contact and his head goes straight down to the ground the moment he says it. We know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, I agree with a lot of that, a couple of things. But the got gone is very common. 
uh, in Southern phrase. That that's uh, it's not an Arkansas, Arkansasian phrase, however you'd say it, Chase. But in in uh, in in Tennessee, it's it's very common up the mountain. South Georgia too. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a very common phrase. Uh, this, up to this point, the, the video we saw before this, a lot of movement going on, but even more here. And I think he's, I, I think you're correct about that as well. I think he's just about fed up uh, with this. Um, that's what that hand slap means. He's, he's just, he just, he doesn't know where to go with it from there. He, I, I don't think he knows where to go with it. His cadence more than doubles again here. He's just speeding right along. He's he's already talked about where he was that day so many times. He's just getting right through it, but I think he's I think we're seeing frustration here. That's one of the one of the main things we're seeing, and I think it's the son uh, getting in the little kid's face. Plus the fact he's not around a bunch of adults all the time, and I think those news people are looking at him. And when he catches his eyes with him, I think that's why he's breaking eye contact. I could be wrong about that, but I think I watched that from the beginning. Every time he looks up and, he, and you can tell, because he just doesn't look down, his whole body kind of scooches down. I could be wrong about that, because I, you know, we're on the other side of the camera. Are they asking anything of you other than just people that you might suspect, or, you know, situations you might suspect? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I'm at work all the time. You know, and, you know Candace was on one side of the house when she got gone. That, you know, not even... 50, 60 feet away. You know, we know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. Right. The incident with Summer happened when Summer disappeared. Where were you working that day? Um, let's see, I was at, uh, I was in Jonesboro. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Jonesboro, which? Yeah, Jonesboro. Um, uh, Tennessee? Yeah. Okay, because I, I, yeah. I don't know this area very well. Yeah. How Jones far away is that from home? Well, it takes 45 minutes to get from there to my house. Okay. And uh, so up 81 all the way, and uh, that's where I was working. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? So I think uh, there's loping that's ever present through a lot of these things. Greg right here is probing for some more baseline and making a couple admissions that, you know, I'm not from here, I don't know the area very well, which helps the other person to open up more. And this actually works. And his baseline is usually different when he's uh, asking someone different types of questions. So we're going to see his eyes move different ways. Uh, we're going to see him react different ways to something called episodic memory of events and things that he recalls. And next is spatial and detail memory. So when we're thinking about spatial and detail memory. This is like, what did the room look like? How big was something? And finally, we're going to see a different behavioral reaction when he's discussing a memory of dialogue and when he spoke to a person. That may not be all the categories. Those are the big three that we can actually pinpoint and look for here pretty easily. Uh, Greg and Scott uh, left the silence there for him to keep talking, and it actually worked. And uh, so up 81 all the way, and uh, that's where I was working. You can see how easy this is. Greg and Scott just didn't say, okay, as soon as he became a little bit close to being finished, uh, he continued to speak when he says up 81 and that's where I was working. He continued to talk to fill in the silence, which is great. And we're looking at uh, both of you guys and your quarter zip fleece that had to be planned. I'm, I'm watching this video wondering <laughs> about the planning for that. But uh, it, Scott, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, we, we, we didn't want to go in and match like we're twinsies, but it was important to have to at least have a look that that the, from the top part, you had this, but the bottom part, you had jeans that were a little bit old and a little bit and Greg had on his cowboy boots and I had on sneakers. So it was, so we didn't want to look like we were, you know, FBI agents coming in in suits and like, hey, tell me what's going on. He's, he's been dealing yeah, with all that. Of course. We want to kind of be kind of so yeah that's that's really good chase i, I wanted but, to bring like it up just so people would understand why that was important and you look unified as if you're on, on a team together yeah yep there you go yep yeah yeah we're okay well we'll talk about that later uh, anyway um where's my oh yeah so as and again talk about the interrogation part of it listen to greg's tone of voice it's real soft as he, it, and it's and it's odd for, for us to see Greg being all calm and soft about something, for a lot of people anyway, not me. And to, to be so kind as he's saying all these things, when, especially when somebody in, in that situation. So 
pay attention to, to our approach to these, the way we're talking. You'll see our tone, our to tones of voice, voices, how you say it, grammatically correct, change as we go throughout this. And our body language will change as well. Right now we're being very still. We're getting things really, really quiet. The lighting guys did a great job in there because they made it almost feel like a room in there of, of darkness around this light thing. The, the stuff we're looking at now will have to be brightened up a little bit because the this edit of it is too dark but we're, we're trying to, we're, we're taking advantage of that it was really quiet in there. there's a really big room but it was really small right there so it gave us that that intimate um feel with him and we were just close enough to reach out and touch him that's what you want you want to be close enough to do that whereas we had that happened a couple of times in um in emotional parts of the of the interview so our approach to it i'll talk about that on this end of it um was at this point to be really calm and and understanding with him as we're trying to find out this information not only because we're trying to get him in a certain mood we want to see how he how he reacts to those questions in that mode as well in that mode that we're in as well so that's that was really important uh greg what do you got yeah so one thing i'm talking softer here you'll notice because i'm trying to bring him down to a different place and i'm not trying to threaten everyone everyone thinks i'm this mean scream and yell guy and we always say if you're being interrogated that way you're really not no one's effective doing that you should not even realize you're being interrogated as a matter of fact the guys with us thought well i wish you'd gotten what you wanted when it was over and we said oh oh trust us we got what we wanted yeah we got everything. because it was just a conversation but what i was after here is the first minor probe. This is a probe. Where were you? You know he's been asked this question a dozen times, a thousand times. And as far as I know, TBI and those guys will have cleared his story and said where he's at. So I didn't push too hard to go and find that. But when he said Jonesboro, his eye contact was really high. His blink rate goes way down, if you notice this, because he's certain of what he's saying. And he then he makes intentional eye breaks occasionally. And he tells me about this 45 minutes. Now, Here's something that tells me I've tapped into a part of his brain that knows I'm on a threat question. I hear him start to change his speech pattern and he goes, and, uh, and, uh, and that's where I was. And to your point, Chase, he's trying to figure out what am I after? And he's trying to make sure he satisfies what I'm after, but that and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, in there proves to me I'd hit the right spot with him. And so we're in the right cadence, we're at the right speech pattern, we have the right amount of eye contact, the right amount of silence, and you'll see us use this again as we get deeper into the questioning. We, we intentionally, I told him, they're gonna be hard questions I'm going to ask you. And I'll tell you when I'm gonna ask you hard questions. And people say, well, you're telegraphing. Yeah, because it creates stress. And that's a wonderful thing to say, I'm about to ask you some hard questions. Well, what are you gonna ask? And you can see it in people when you do it. But if you'll watch him, he's nodding to, to get agreement. And when he says, I'm up 81 all the way, you just should know that when a person changes this way, it means you're tapping into something that's creating stress for them. And it's clear in his case. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so it is a stress question. It is where, where were you the night of? So it's it's the it's one of the first questions that's going to come in, which has some heat behind it. And you might look at it and you might go, "Wow, there's a bit of a pause there," and he and and he doesn't seem to remember the name of the place, or you know, why doesn't that immediately come? Well, the things the things in his life don't immediately come. The numbers, the things don't immediately come. The space is there for him. He knows that really well. He doesn't access the names of things so well. There's, there's a neural type that, that goes with that, but I'm not gonna diagnose. But, and by the way, you know, body language can often just be a Rorschach test of you. So I'm gonna look at him and I'm gonna most likely see me. And you're gonna look at him and you're most likely gonna see you. So what you've gotta do is pick up on some of what I'm saying and go, so is Don more like Mark or is he more like me because i'm also going to engage my critical thinking as well and go it feels like me i bet he's a bit like me and he can't kind of work out the name of things but what if that isn't true perhaps it's not true so you've got to use his critical thinking ideas of perhaps and maybe so here's one of those we see him take a big in breath on that and this is a critical question there and he's breathing changes there well i already know this is a critical question and so i'm already primed to go oh i want to check out his breathing see if that breathing changes does he do big breathing heavy breathing and on a first glance he does 
but then I go back and look at the baseline and he doesn't. So, so you got to keep going back and looking at the baseline. This is not, you know, really far enough off his baseline that I would suggest that he wasn't exactly where he says he was at this point. I think any disruption in this, any deviance from the, from the baseline that we've got is about this is a pressure question. This is an institutionalized guy. He knows that when the big question come, you got to be careful, whatever, whether you did it or you didn't do it, you've got to be careful. That's what I got for you on that one. And the incident with Summer happened when Summer disappeared. Where were you working that day? Um, let's see, I was at, uh, I was in Jonesboro. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Jonesboro, which? Yeah, Jonesboro. Um, uh, Tennessee? Yeah. Okay, because I, I, yeah. I don't know this area very well. Yeah. How Jones far away is that from home? Well, it takes 45 minutes to get from there to my house. Okay. And uh, so up 81 all the way, and uh, that's where I was working. And can you tell us a little bit, you know, what Summer was doing that afternoon or that evening? She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother, and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door, and she went into the house, and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, where's Summer? She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. Greg, what do you got? One interesting thing throughout everything we're going to see this guy do is that he has the same cadence almost exactly throughout every interview he's done, which is interesting for me because it makes me think, okay, that's kind of a baseline for him. Yeah, it's slow, it's drawling and that kind of thing, but that's how he speaks. In this storytelling, you cannot miss that he's storytelling because his cadence changes. If you pay attention, when he goes into storytelling mode and he said, I was not home when this happened, and then he starts down this third party story and you can tell he's repeating what he's been told. She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door and she went into the house and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, we're summer. She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. That's all he's got. Not a single verbal bridge, not a, and then after that, just walks through the details. And I, I am having a hard time. I'm looking at him because his brow is up in the center. His mouth is down. His lids are low, but he's also out in the sun. So I'm not going to read everything into it. I am going to say he's gripping his kid. He's got that same thing where he's gripping him and he's, he's adapting. If this were he was home and he was telling me the story, I would probably call it a red flag because the cadence changes. But knowing that he's heard this second, third hand, so, so no big deal. However, it is with that and blink rates and all of that, we have to look for positives as well. He's illustrating with his right hand. Now he can't with his left hand, but he is illustrating the story with his right hand. And you see what Chase, I think you would call body narration when he's moving around a little bit as well, trying to get the message across. And then he does a sour taste, as you would say, Mark. It's hard to tell with all the facial hair. Mm. But he does a sour taste and shakes his head like this when he's saying she was gone. And so you would expect that's a negative and negative. And, you know, a lot of people would say shaking his head no when he's telling you something that doesn't mean that means that it's it's a lie. We all know that's not the truth. We know that we're looking for it to match the message he's delivering. And Chase, I think you had a great one recently where the guy went like this for yes and like this for no, that's a big deal. But if the guy's saying it was a bad thing and he does that, then you expect it to be something different. Right. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I would say, again, tongue grooming before speaking. So for me, uh, I think that, you know, these little bits of tongue action that we see always before he speaks is just, he always prepares like that. Um, I don't think we're seeing any kind of preparation around around potential deceit or or anything that that you might read on the internet about lip licking or tongue juts or or whatever i think again it's it's kind of baseline for him he'd probably do the same at church when he gets up to speak uh the boys were on the internet of course the boys were on the internet of course kind of interested by by that is that about 
you know, is that an alibi? Is that a, about, well, aren't they, you know, a, set, a, a sense of annoyance around kids all, always being on the internet? That, that of course, um, is, is of interest. Why are you trying to point that out? So I'm keeping my eyes and ears open around that piece there. But on the whole, like he's forward and agreeable. When I turn the sound off, you know, although we get some of these head shakes, which are about very specific things, he's very forward, he's very agreeable. Um, he's not displaying many of the things that we've seen in the past when we know or suspect that somebody is, is trying to hold back information. And especially in this case, I agree, Greg, he is taking us through the story that he's heard from his from his wife. And from what I've heard of her story, it really doesn't deviate from that at all, which makes me feel like he doesn't feel like he needs to add anything. He kind of thinks it's good as it is. It's, it's good enough. That story that, that does the, that does the job, whatever job that's meant to do, that does the job. He doesn't need to add anything. He doesn't need to take anything away from it. So it's, it's, you know, it's, pretty good at the moment uh chase what do you got for us yeah i agree with you guys absolutely here I, and, and i will say that the lip licking thing i will always treat as a potential marker for deception uh until i see otherwise and obviously it's just it's going into a pile we're not going to see it and say none of us will ever tell you that one of these behaviors it means that somebody's being deceptive but once they get into a pile uh, they start to uh, start to become a little more solid ground. So I would always suggest for any reporter that's interviewing these people, start your interview with some truthful questions. Where do you work? How long have you worked there? Tell us, uh, you know, about, you know, what you like about doing what you do or, you know, things that people are willing to talk about and get some baseline for people like us to help out. Uh, so let's go with some red flags since you guys are, uh, let's go with some things that might suggest otherwise. The story is focused on in innocence with a, only a tiny mention of the disappearance. And there's no uh, attempt whatsoever to get us how he feels. There's no emotion uh, conveyed here at all. And also another failure to mention the name of the victim. And finally, one thing that Almost universally, people who are missing a child and go on TV do, they have zero problem completely overtaking the interview and stomping all over the reporter's question to get out exactly what they want to get out. They do not answer questions as if they're trying to pass a test. Uh, and I think this is also uh, one of those indicators. Maybe this should be one of, one of our things on our checklist. But uh, people who we've seen in the past who have these videos and they're genuine, they have no problem derailing uh, the interview to talk about uh, getting the child back. And there's no mention of getting Summer back in this video. Scott? All right. Um, he, uh, th this gives me the feeling that, that he's told this a lot, he's heard this a lot, and, and it gives me the feeling he wasn't there um, at the beginning, which I believe we under the impression he wasn't there from the, the information we got. Um, the reason I think that is because his recall on this, like Greg was talking about, is great. She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother, and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door, and she went into the house, and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, we're summer. She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. I mean, he's just, he's repeat. he's speeding right along, and he's repeating the same story he's heard over and over and over for the past few days. He's heard his wife tell it a thousand times because they've been sitting there. Now, tell me again what happened. That's how you find those inconsistencies in a story that you can box him in with. You ask him the same thing. Not only do you ask him, somebody else will ask him, and he's heard it a lot, so he's just cruising right there. That's why his arm is going in a circular motion, almost like, well, here's what happened, here's what happened. That's why he can speed through it like that. 
And he sort of keeps this mode happening. He's in listening mode. And we know that because his head's tilted a little bit and that ear comes forward just a little bit. And that lets you know someone is, that gives you the impression someone is, is listening to you. And as he's going through this, he goes, and, so, and this happened, and then, and then and this happened. So they went in. That's another thing. These these words that are linked, these conjunctions, linking these, link, linking these things together are just, there's information and information a little break and and she wanted to go into the house so my wife watched her go into the door and she went into the house and the boys were on the internet of course and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys so when so he's going through remember it in those in those chunks like that um not using any barriers he doesn't look stressed and the only really illustrator he's using is his arm when he's doing that little movement with his arm I don't see him trying to 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 block anything. I don't see him trying to hold back anything. I think he's given up all he knows about this at this point. Uh, again, let's pay attention to all the times he says and and so as we run through this. All right. We good? Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit, you know, what Summer was doing that afternoon or that evening? She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother, and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door, and she went into the house, and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, we're Summer. She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. Good, let's move. Is there anything about Candace's story that makes you question the story? No, not the way it played out and everything like that. I mean, yeah, you always have questions, and I'd ask myself, and, uh, but the way that it happened and her emotions and her state of mind. What, did you, what were the questions that you had? I mean, I, I, not, I don't really have any, I mean, I question, not, I don't really have any questions, I mean. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is a really good example. I had a question, I asked the thought, I heard him stammer, stutter, I had a follow-up, and I actually stepped on Scott, because Scott was trying to get more information out of him here. If I'd been a little quieter, we would have gotten a little more information. But I think he was, candidly, I think he's out of information, he was just stammering to stammer. This made me wonder, did he truly believe the story he'd been told? Because what he's telling us is a story that's secondhand. And when he tells us a secondhand story, it's rote memory. It's exactly what you expect from a secondhand story. You'll see him push his tongue out of his lips. Now his lips are bright ruby red, and we think it's probably because he smokes a fair amount and that kind of thing. But he does lick his lips a lot on when he gets under the stressful situation. M means something, maybe, but it is in his baseline. As he's going along, though, you, he cannot finish an entire thought. Now, he is not the most eloquent speaker, and you know, Don would tell you that himself. I'm not beating him up for the way he speaks because we all have our own patterns. I have my own very southern speech pattern. But he stops and stammers and um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 uh. I mean, I, I, no, I don't really have any. I mean, I question, no, I don't really have any questions. I mean, I'm sure, number one, he's got to realize that Candace is going to watch this. Number two, how does it t work their stories? So this is a stress moment. We're seeing something in him that causes both Scott and I to want to go, hmm, why can't he answer that question with a simple no? If you asked me if my wife did something, I would have said no. Very simply, this is not a no. This is something much different. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, that was the point where we were both. I was waiting for for Greg to jump up his hind end, and he was waiting for me to jump up his hind end. And but we knew better than, than that at that point because yeah. all he's got to do is get up and leave. If we if we leaned into him really hard at that point, and as it, loping stops here, loping is where you're telling a story almost like a, a something loping through a field, like a horse running through a field, that kind of thing. And we're not seeing that here. He's editing as he goes along. He's self-editing in real time. Should I say this? What am I going to say? Then when he decides he didn't have any questions, when I said, well, what kind of questions did you have? And he didn't. And again, notice my tone of voice when we're saying that because we know this is important. We can't say, well, what kind of questions did you have? So we had to say, what kind of questions did you have? Almost almost like mm, throwing it out there. And his, and when he's answering as he self-edits, he's, he's thinking – I've got to be cool about this because you're right, Greg, he's got to go home to his life and his wife and live there. And she's going to be like, what, you don't believe me? What the hell are you talking about? You don't believe me. 
So he's got to deal with that. Knowing that as well, it was, it was the reason for our soft approach. But it's really important in there because that's when we both, you're right, Greg, that's when we both said, you know what? I'm not so sure he believes what she's saying. And th this, we expand on that at another point, but it, this is really important part of it because this is not in his baseline. This is completely out of his baseline. He's really quiet. His eyes, his blink rate goes low. He's looking, he is licking his lips, but I don't think that's pushing out, you know, sour taste and all that. I don't think that's that at all. I think it's from, I think it's, a, it's like a tick, like a nervous habit he has. But that's why his, his lips are so slick from smoking and doing that all the time. So, and licking his lips all the time. I think that's what that's from. So that we're not seeing any, I'm not going to say we're not seeing deception in there. Because it's I've seen a bunch of red flags, there are like four of them in a row right there where he starts slowing down and, and he's editing. But that really was a point where I go, hmm, I'm not so sure he believes what he's saying. And as he's editing himself, I think he knows what he's going to say, but he's chopping it up and pushing things back into rows to make sure everything's straight so he's good to go. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so here's what I think he does know. He says, um, he doesn't have questions about how it played out, the physical time of the narrative, all the stuff that he's good at. He doesn't have any questions around how that story played out, the time span, the, 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 the space. I don't think he's got a problem with that. It's got no questions around that. Um, the emotions and the state of mind. Now, again, he's talked about emotions in his baseline and he's pretty good at going, you know, uh, proud and, and naming emotions and, and, and happy. And so, so, and those are pretty basic, but that's a good baseline to say, if he thinks he knows that somebody is emotionally in a state, he's, he's already said that he's pretty good at that. He's proved that he's pretty good at that. So he's got no problem with that. He says, you always have questions. So we could look, we could bias towards the idea of, yeah, maybe he does wonder is Candace's story correct? Or maybe it's just the idea of, well, until you know something for sure, you always have questions. So there's the idea of mystery always exists, regardless until mystery is solved. And, um, and I've, and he says, and I've asked myself, doesn't really finish that. The question is, what have you asked yourself? Because if you ask it of yourself, is it that, well, I asked myself, could I have done more? Could I have been better? Could I have protected more? He, in this whole interview, you hear about how unprotected that place is. It's completely exposed with people coming up, swapping out dogs. You know, just, I'll take your dog, I'll leave some other dogs there. They come up on horses, all kinds of other stuff to do stuff and stuff and things. And so it's a bit of an odd situation up there. And maybe you would ask yourself, is this really somewhere that have I really provided the right place? Have, has, has my wife, my partner provided the right place? So it could, it could be that I question any, any eye blocks on that. Chase, what are your thoughts on this? You guys got all the good stuff here. But th uh, this video really shows us the power of baseline and how important baseline is. We know Don Wells likes to start questions as soon as he is able to get the gist of what you're asking him. This question was concise, crystal clear, and easily understood. And this amount of hesitation here would be a significant red flag for me in any interview. And I think Don starts to roll down a hill that Scott kind of put him on here and making him start to speak specifically about what he doesn't believe about the story. Because Scott just Scott kind of left a little incomplete question or just to, just kind of tossed that up. Well, what what is it? What is it you, you question? And just kind of started this ball rolling. And there's an increased blink rate when he's saying when he's denying that he fully believes Candace's story or he doesn't have any questions about it. And there's a single shoulder shrug, which indicates a lack of confidence in what a person is saying right at the end here. And if we scored this on the behavioral table of elements for deception, the score would be a 16 with a score of 11, indicating a likelihood of deception to be high. Does, is there anything about Candace's story that makes you question the story? No, not the way it played out and everything like that. I mean, yeah, you always have questions and I ask myself and uh, 
but the way that it happened and her emotions and her state of mind. What did you? What were the questions that you had? I mean, I, I not. I don't really have any. I mean, I question. Not, I don't really have any questions. I mean. Did you rape your sister? No. Did you rape your niece? No. Did you molest your first set of children? No. Did you threaten to kill them? I can right? give you. I can give you my kids' this number, and we can talk when this is done. Sure, sure. And we'll did, talk to them. Sure. Did Did you threaten to kill them? No. Okay. I want to go last. Okay. Stuart, you want to go first? <laughs> We're seeing this eye closure, which guarantee you, if if uh, if we just aired this without our analysis, we'd see a thousand comments of like, oh, there's rapid blinking. He's lying. Uh, we're looking at clusters to determine deception. We're looking at multiple things to determine deception. And we've also determined that this blinking is part of his baseline. He's processing data on every single question here. Each denial is rapid. His answer is rapid. He tends to have a lot of latency, which is a time between the end of a question and the beginning when there is hesitation and when there's doubt and when there's like, I need some time to make something up or I need some time to think through my answer. This eye closure is not enough to say that he's being deceptive. And the only movement here uh, of hesitation is the final denial that he makes. On the very final denial, the small retreating motion of the head and some eye closure there, and neither of these would score as deceptive. Even adding them together would only give you an eight. So this is an, a, an excellent masterclass, mini micro masterclass in what we're talking about when we say clusters. It's like there's a, here's a deceptive behavior. Here's a deceptive behavior. It doesn't mean much. And one of those deceptive behaviors that you might see is something that this person does habitually all the time, no matter what they're talking about. So that's when we say baseline is important and probably secondary to baseline is looking at clusters. Scott, what do you got? All right. I'm going to, I'm going to say the last one. So different than those first three questions. Did you threaten to kill him? No. All the classics backs up. says, as he says, no, it goes quieter. Huh? No. But you see here that go up there in the middle, man, that's when I want to, but there's no reason to lay into that because it doesn't lay, it doesn't, go with what we're, we're dealing with at that point. So I laid off it, but that's the one that made me get bigger. I wanted to go, yes, you did. You know, you did. I want to do one of those, <laughs> but I, I didn't at that point, but I, I would have had every right to uh, looking back on it. So, um, the, the I think I agree with Chase hundred percent. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would agree. Um, so clear, confident denial in the, in the, in the first lot of them and in, in within that first lot he even confronts becomes aggressive i would say uh with with uh greg there like we've seen him get at other times and then he substantiates his claim not a great substantiation like you know we can go and ask these people if you like that's not a huge substantiation but he does substantiate at that point he's clearly going to go look let's it's not just me that's going to say this it's other people as well ask the community kind of thing so so that's that's important but i would agree we get swallow gesture on the last one we get slight slight sour taste there we get slight head turn on that as well yeah if i were to lay money has has he th threatened in some way to kill somebody in some way at some point Pr yeah probably Probably, but is it important for this situation here? I, I don't think so. But I think he knows. Yeah, he's 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 at a he's at a number, or he's you know, or he's got angry, and he's said some stuff, and and I think you know many of us might fall into that position at some point as well. And if asked that question, uh, you know, and, and wanting to say no, we might show some of the same indicators as well. Greg, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so this is a really good one for me. We always say that people can have more than one way of dealing with folks in, in a situation. What I think we're seeing here is Don dealing with authority, where he perceives us to be authority or whatever it is, and he is very kind and polite and quiet. I guarantee you, and this is not just Don, this is everybody, there's another side we are not seeing here. That swallow before he gets to that question, 
These are nasty questions. And if you think he's responding by his blink rate or that coming, any one of you, just show up and let me poke you and ask you, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you? We tell you all the time that people get angry when they're accused of something they didn't do. And we can see a little bit of that and that rise in his respiration, a little bit of that. Just pay attention to him and you'll see just a little edge rise in Don at this point. I could see it there. And then I agree with you, Scott, and with you, well, with the three of you, when he gets to that fourth question and he goes, no, no, something sounds odd and off. And I agree with you, Mark. Did you threaten to kill him? It could mean I'm going to kill you if you keep that up. It could mean, no, I'm going to come out there and kill you. We know that he can rant and rave. You can find him on YouTube and doing that kind of thing. But every person can when pushed to a point. I'm not defending him, but saying I can see the other person behind there. And Don's not a little fella. He's a good sized fella. Mm -hmm. So he's probably been accustomed and he works with his hands. He's probably been accustomed to being physical in his life, and he had to make it through. As he told us in the very beginning of the story, I was raised in county jails. So he had to be relatively tough in his life, and I would bet with the right amount of pushing, I could get a little bit more aggression out of him. And I could sense that sitting across from him and asking these very ugly questions. And I agree with you, he went and said, we'll call my kids. He didn't say, we'll call my other accusers because they're accusing. They're also accusing him of doing something to his kids. But he said, my kids will tell you that didn't happen. And so there, I'll leave it at that. Did you rape your sister? No. Did you rape your niece? No. Did you molest your first set of children? No. Did you threaten to kill him? I can give you. I can give you my kids' number, and we can talk when this is done. Sure, sure. And we'll did, talk to him. Sure. Did Did you threaten to kill him? No. Okay. All right, here we go. Do you know where Summer is? Oh no. I wish you I did. Any earthly idea what happened to her? No. I wish I did. Do you think Candace had anything to do with it? No. And what about this? You, and you think what might have happened to her was what? She was kidnapped. Yeah. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, very simple. Um, she was kidnapped. Seems very assured of that. Downward intonation on that. Um, the, the eye contact that he has on that. Really, really assured. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I've got a question about it. Um, any earthly idea what happened to him, uh, to her? And then we get this eye flutter on that. And I don't know what that might be about. So I'm kind of interested what, you, you know, ideas on that uh chase uh, what do you think any any answer for me on that i flutter just after any earthly idea what happened no i think he's processing data i think an eye flutter wouldn't mean very much um did you want me to go as well yeah 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 yeah, right. yeah i'm done i mean that's just assured for me that's the only question i have in that one yeah. okay so the, his <laughs> eye closure here if we're just going to stick on that is different in the question about candace Think Candace had anything to do with it? No. In every other question throughout the entire video, even the, the clips that we're not looking at here with you, his eyes flutter. When I'm talking about Candace, they shut. They are shut down. And each of his denials are contain multi-syllables. There are high frequency tones, there's low frequency tones, so there's tonal fluctuation in his voice. And when it comes time to Talk about Candace. Scott asked him about Candace and Scott gives you gave him time to talk. You didn't you didn't just let him say one thing. There's plenty. There's a huge window of time for him to talk. So there's no frequency, no highs and lows, one syllable, one word answer. And it's a downward tone. I think Candace had anything to do with it. No. Which is the opposite of him talking about being kidnapped. She was kidnapped. And and this stands out as being so different uh, that this is a huge red flag. His eyebrows move and communicate in every single denial except for the one about Candace. His head shake slowed down and was more deliberate when it came down to talking or denying uh, speak when he's speaking about Candace. And his no turned into a nah. No. More when he was making that denial about Candace and he nods his head yes while saying that she was kidnapped, which goes with his baseline behavior is in that he believes it and that he agrees with that statement. So I will say the there is, uh, I'll just say, I would suggest that there is a very high likelihood for deception around the question that Scott, you specifically asked uh, about Candace. I'll let you talk about that. All right. Um, 
my concern with 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 this at at first was when I said, "Do you know what happened to her?" And he said, "No, I wish I did." Now, a lot of times you'll hear parents say, "I wish I did." After that, no, I wish I did. That's that's fairly common if you go through through the, these people that are they're asked that question. But when we got to the end, I said, well, "What is it you think that happened to her?" And I was saying these things not like, "So, what do you think happened to her?" It was their very wide as I'm asking him. So he has to take him in word at a time and almost guess what I'm going to say next. So we can get that reaction once it dawns on him. That's the part that bothered me when he said she was kidnapped. Greg has a great take on, on that specifically. Um, but we find, I, I think later on we get, we get into a situation where as he goes through, we, we still aren't confident that he believes Candace. I, and for my, my, perception of what's going on I'm not so sure he believes what she's saying because what what chase what you're saying you've covered everything on that so yeah the eye and her eye blinks have and her eye blocking at that point has a plays a huge part in that huge part in that um greg what do you got yeah there's a difference in in, in chase you're on to exactly what i was hearing everything else there's the no no oh uh. Oh, just if you just listen, it's a grunt almost when he comes out about Candace. And I had the same suspicions. And the last one, I'm going to leave everything else off and just talk about the last one. Kidnapped is the first time we hear this word. He's used the word abducted before. Kidnapped is not the same as abducted. Kidnapped usually comes along with a request for something in exchange for the person. Most all humans think that. We watch TV. We know. Now, could it be that it's a subtlety wasted on Don? Could be. But when I heard that word, my brain went ding, 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 because, you know, I'm a hammer and nails are there. And I worked, you know, anti terror through my life. Kidnapping means something. There's a reason. It's political, it's economic. He has nothing political to offer. So, what, are, what in his head does he think kidnapping means? And then, along with that Candace thing, it, it, it just raised all of my red flags. Now, does that mean that he intentionally did that? Don't know. Does it, did he say kidnapping versus abduction? He said in other places. Don't know. Does he know the difference? Don't know. We didn't get to that level of nuance. The last thing I'll leave you with is when you're talking about someone you have a very tightly bonded relationship with and they've been together for a long time, your tone may be different when you're talking about them. If I ask Scott about Amber, his tone will be different than if I ask him about Chase. For example, because you're I don't know about that. Well, I, I, you never yeah. know. I don't know about your guys' relationship you know, outside right? of work. We're very close. <laughs> Chase and I are very close. Do you know where Summer is? Oh well, no, I wish you I did. Any earthly idea what happened to her? No, I wish I did. Do you think Candace had anything to do with it? No. And what about this? You, and you think what might have happened to her was what? She was getting out. Yeah. Right. Great. All right, now awesome. let's run around the room really quickly, and we'll all give, uh, you know, 30 seconds or less of what we think happened. We'll go to Mark, we'll go to Sweetie Pie, then we'll go to, to Greg, and we'll see what or where we end up there. Mark? Yeah. So, uh, you know, what comes out of this for me is how easily he wa gets wound up in this soap opera that's, that's going on uh, concurrently with the search for Summer Wells. And... I think it's quite easy for us to get wound up in that soap opera. What I take away from this is to try not to do that and try and stick to the, the more factual elements that we can see around us. Uh, so really, you know, this whole thing is just a lesson for me in saying, can we, can we keep things a little bit narrower and not widen it out into this extraordinary soap opera with, with stepsisters and all kinds of, and, and YouTubers and Facebook and all these people involved and narrow it a little more down? Cause I think that's where we're going to find the real issues here. When I look through the whole of the interview, I do get interested by how um, unsecure that area is and all the people who come up with, for, for all kinds of reasons, uh, looking for her. Um, that's where my nose would be going right, right now towards that. Not so much on Don. It could be wrong. Chase. Your thoughts? 
This video really illustrates the importance of understanding microcultures and cultural differences in people. This is the reason that we baseline human beings. And when we hear these phrases like got gone, and things like that, I didn't know until very recently that that's common along the entire part of the country. That's a super common phrase. My mistake. I'm open, open to admit all that stuff because that's, that's part of what we're understanding when we're talking to somebody that's in a microculture. We're also talking to a person with a checkered past that everyone will use to paint the future. I'm going to dip my finger in this past. I'm going to start to just paint the future. And I'm going to be very certain about what's going on. I think that, in my opinion, that Don Wells is mostly honest. And I think that there is a tremendous amount of doubt or uncertainty that at, at a minimum with Candace's story or her level of involvement or her knowledge of, of what actually took place. And maybe there's some, some knowledge there. I think I went over 30 seconds. I apologize. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is one of those great opportunities for you to take away your bias. I, I'm going to tell you, when I went there, the guy has a background. We know he has a background. He may even still be doing some things that you are, may or may not agree with. I'm not talking to any of that. I went there with one purpose in mind. I wanted to know what he knew about Summer Wells, what this whole thing is about, and whether he was involved in the disappearance of Summer Wells. I'll tell you based on his baseline, which we went through a lot of process to discover, pushing him into corner with some simple questions that he had no reason to lie about that caused stress and looking for that stress level to rise. And then finally going right to the point and hammering and seeing him emotional about this kid the day before. I'm going to tell you, I don't believe he's involved in her disappearance. Could I be wrong? Sure. But based on everything I saw face to face, based on everything I felt and saw and learned and thought and listened by watching and listening to his baseline and looking for deviation at the key moments, I don't think he's involved. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you, Greg. I don't think he is either. H having been there with him, I agree 100% with you. I don't think he was involved at all. He, he didn't answer the questions correctly to be involved as, as far as that goes. But I agree with you guys. This is a perfect example of, it's, it's a great example of being able to not only uh, watch somebody be questioned and, and interviewed, but be able to, to get the other side of the people who are interviewing it, give you their side of it as well. Why we ask questions this way, why our approach was a certain way, why we were quiet here, why we get a little bit louder in other parts, which I think we're going to do. Are we going to do a, part, a next part two of this, you guys? I'm, I'm for it. Sure. We still we got we should more. keep bringing it up until we find Summer. Sure. Okay. Yeah, because they're going to find out what happened. And I, I, and I agree with Greg. I don't think he had anything to do with it. So at the same time, I don't think I don't think he believes Candace or, or, or her story on that, whatever it is, you know, I guess from the TV interviews. So I think it's a great example to be able to see someone be interviewed and also get the, the um, the input from people who interviewed that person and why they did it and give you an insight as to what we're thinking is to get those uh, questions asked and to, to elicit those answers from them. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. All you got to do is hit that little red thing down there and then hit the bell so it lets you know when we have a new one come out. I just want to say a quick thanks to Dr. Phil and the entire Paramount uh, team here. I'm in L.A. I'm staying in a really nice hotel with really crappy Wi-Fi. I texted <laughs> Dr. Phil last night and he had all of this stuff set up. The producers are in here and let me kind of just borrow his little filming area. So I do want to give a, a, a shout out to Dr. Phil and the, and the entire team here uh, for letting me come crash the studio. Yeah, nice. Hey, can I add one thing? Guys, everybody listening, you. Summer Wells, post that photo, get her picture. I mean, we know it's in a lot of places. Get her picture everywhere. This is a little kid, and she's missing still. Do what you can to find her. Yeah. Also, Greg and I got our flu shots just to chase his right over there a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> we were there, and Dr. Phil goes, you, you fellas want a flu shot? Because he was getting one. We're like, yeah, we'll do flu shots. So we got our flu shots there as well. Scott, He's Scott a doctor. Cried, so. He's Scott a cried. doctor. <laughs> uh, that's right. He is a doctor. So Scott yeah. cried. <laughs> So it doesn't matter what happened. <laughs> my reaction to it. It's not true. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And this is a good one, fellas. We'll see you next time. See ya.
Bicheiro, não vai receber não, sem ser louco.